trade primarily an economic issue? Or is it um, a tool of morality? You know, we've heard about how we shouldn't trade with countries that are moving away from our values and countries that are you know, coming closer to our values makes sense. Um, but then also we hear all the arguments about, you know, the closest, the closest neighbor, it's most economically viable. Which, which is the more important aspect, the moral or the economic? Andrew, if you want to. I don't really think you can divorce them. Um, uh, the Adam Smith who wrote The Wealth of Nations also wrote The Theory of Moral Sentiments. He never ever sought to divorce moral precepts from um, uh, uh, rules of the markets. The, the two go hand in hand and these are, these are judgment calls you make at the time. You know, the, the, the China that was opening up to the West seriously 20 years ago was a very different place from the one that's now engaging in a genocide against the Uyghurs. The Russia of Gorbachev Glasnost and perestroika and what we thought might become democracy is a fundamentally different place from the one that is ripping up all, rule, all rules of international law, invading its neighbours, annexing their territory, holding fake referendums and engaging in something akin to genocide in the areas of the Ukraine that it's operating in. So you can't separate the two and uh, you need to... Um, keep the two in, in tandem and in conditions where you've got a greater degree of, um, of moral agreement, you're going to have more trade. Where you have a lesser degree of moral agreement, you're going to have less trade and there are conditions, you know, aka North Korea, where you'll have no trade at all. Um, can we justify initiating a trade war if it's at the active uh, detriment to citizens of your own country? Well, I, I sort of feel as if I'm hogging the discussion. Oh. John has a lot, will have a lot of views on this one. <laughs> John. Um, should, the question really is, should we use trade as an instrument of foreign policy? And I think the answer in principle has to be there is no reason why we shouldn't. The answer in practice is, I think, that attempts to do so have mostly been pretty unsuccessful. Uh, Gina quoted the example of South Africa. Uh, which is a possible example of where using it as an instrument of foreign policy was successful. I'm not sure I agree that sanctions and Western sanctions and tr aspects of trade had very much to do with the ultimate collapse of apartheid. But that's about the best case one can produce. The truth is that the sanctions, which we, the economic sanctions which we've imposed against Russia, have, if anything, been counterproductive. That is, we have raised the price of energy to levels which have been effectively financing Putin's war. This has not, as it were, strangled the Russian economy and forced it to, to make peace. It has, if anything, done the opposite. The historic examples of economic sanctions being very successfully pursued are pretty limited. Jana, do you think... Yeah, well, if I, yeah, I'm coming on... Uh, theoretically first is trade economic or moral basically trade for me is economic what is the purpose of trade it is to make yourself and the trading partner better off you know that's the whole theory behind trade and um, in best conditions it works then at some point you can make the moral judgment and say do you want to make this country or this person better off. And then there will be certain countries or certain groups that you don't want to make better off because they'll strengthen them and they might even get back at you with that strength, which is part of, I think, what someone sees with Russia right now. And you also, particularly, you don't want to dependent, be dependent on a trading partner that might turn on you, um, which is, again, what we see with Germany having become dependent on, uh, on Russian gas. But... As a woman in this world, I would not see much trade if we started to say we don't want to trade with those who don't treat us with the human rights. We get cut out the whole Arab world, cut out Japan, cut out China, <laughs> so we could trade with ourselves a bit. I think one has to be practical and just say, yeah, what is trade about? Trade is about people have something that you would like to have and you have something they would like to have, and in that little box uh, that makes everyone better off. And then we can, again, as I said, use that, the power of stopping trade in certain situations. But I actually agree with John that trade embargoes have, in many cases, not produced the results that one wanted to see. And often, it somehow 
gives an impetus to people who have I an mean, embargo against them to stand together. There's a strength in that. Even against, I think, was it Austria in, I can't remember which year it was, not that many years ago, where they had implemented some quite strong uh, policies against immigrants before the rest of Europe followed. At that time, still, Europe went down on, and uh, imposed an embargo on Austria. It didn't work at all. So I'm just um, wondering, um, John is skeptical about the efficacy of sanctions. Um, Andrew, would you be able to make the case for them? Well, tra trade by definition is a two-way thing. Uh, they, they don't want to trade as much with us at the moment. Let's be clear what's happening at the moment. We did not bomb our own pipeline, which was, pr which was producing um, uh, energy from Russia. Uh, that was done by them. So this point about whether you're moving towards or against is hugely important in terms of trade. I also um, I don't accept that sanctions don't have an effect. I think you need constantly, as in all, all forms of, um, of diplomacy and economic diplomacy is the same as all others, you need to learn and improve. Uh, sanctions against individuals uh, can be extremely uh, effective. And indeed, the extent to which the individuals in question who have been subject to massive personal sanctions, in the case of the Russian elite, have sought to evade those sanctions, to get round them and to have them laid aside so that they can enjoy their huge houses here in London and their penthouse apartments in New York is, is quite telling. And they wouldn't be doing that if they didn't think that they were effective. So you constantly need to improve uh, your sanctions. But the idea that in this interchange between states where you're seeking to create zones of stability, and if you believe in moral precepts as, as we do, of democracy, the rule of law and human rights, you shouldn't be seeking to advance them. I think it's totally unrealistic that you wouldn't seek to do that. But it requires judgment. And what may apply in one circumstance won't apply in any other, uh, won't apply in others. And it is a there is a big and fundamental difference in, in my experience of government and dealing with, with um, overseas government as to whether if they are in the category we've talked about which is basically authoritarian whether they are fundamentally moving towards you or fundamentally moving against if they're moving towards you the whole climate in which you conduct diplomacy and trade is fundamentally more open and reciprocal than if they're moving against you and there has rarely been a case of a country moving against us so dramatically as uh, Russia since it invaded its European neighbor on February the 24th. Okay, thank you, Andrew. I think I want to uh, move um, on to a few more examples. So um, John said in his opening statement, this idea of countries that share our values or don't share our values is kind of a weird binary. And so, you know, we've had a lot of talk about Russia. I'm interested in talking more about China, perhaps Saudi Arabia. And where do we decide where that threshold of sharing our values is? You talk about it's a movement thing rather than a fixed thing. But, you know, there are obviously many countries with which we share some values, but not all values. India springs to mind, perhaps. Um, and I want to know, John, uh, how you see that topography. I mean, we, people here share very few values with Saudi Arabia either at the government level or at the individual level. But if you ask what is an effect, what is the main liberalizing effect in Saudi Arabia? It is openness to the West and the fact that they, they need us uh, to, to buy their oil in order to support their regime. If we are, is, are we doing good for Saudi Arabia by trading with Saudi Arabia? It's complicated because we're supporting Saudi Arabian corruption but we're also supporting the importation of our kind of values at the individual level into Saudi Arabia in ways that is having a, a dramatic effect and will have a more dramatic effect over time when people in that country realize they don't have to live in the way in which they lived historically, especially women, it changes everything and it is changing everything. So in general, I think, um, I'm not in principle against using trade uh, as a weapon for spreading our, our moral values. I think it's much more relevant at the individual and individual business level than it is at the national level for reasons I've described. I'm skeptical about what the, both about what the ideas of, idea of national values is in this sense. And the, but the positive effects I'm describing are the results of trade at the level of the individual and the, and the particular business, not the results of trade uh, at, at the national level. But trade at the individual and business level is actually one of the main means by which we share our values or we spread our values, because that's 
the way in which we have relations with a lot of people uh, who are not uh, who are not part of our family, who are not part of our kin. It is an economic relation, and by uh, influencing the ways in which we trade, we can export the kind of values of tolerance, human rights, and the like, which we which we applaud. Jan, you want to uh, respond? Yeah. Um, because I think what is also interesting when we talk about Saudi Arabia is the fact that how come that when a country has such different values than us and is popped up uh, by the money we pour into um, the regime that then can hold down their population b with, with those funds, that we have not diverted away from oil much earlier. There's, I mean, such interest in the financial earnings of the oil uh, industry that we couldn't take a moral position on Saudi Arabia, but we should have. And I do agree that when we trade and it opens societies and we can influence you know, indirectly through that. Unfortunately, I think in the case of Saudi Arabia, uh, not enough interaction actually flows into the society with the trade. It's very much, you know, the regime that takes the advantage. But imagine the strength we do that it's not through direct, you know, trade flow stopping, but if we diverted our dependence on that energy source called oil, but, you know, even with Russia, the whole thing is the dependence on the gas. We can change that by changing our consumption of energy, you know, or the composition of... To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.